thank you all for having me. It's it's definitely an honor to be presenting and speaking in front of you all. And thank you again, Regina, for reaching out to me and keeping me in mind when when this came up. I appreciate it. Um, and it just really just start right in and I'm gonna share the other side to my story, another piece that hasn't really been seen through the lens of the documentary. And it just started when I was growing up with my mom and she was always singing, always singing through the worst of it, through the best of it, she just sang. And because I was, am and always will be a mama's boy. <laughs> I wanted to sing just like her. I wanted to act, be, do, and just breathe like my mom in everything she did. And so one Christmas, she actually got me a, a karaoke machine. And then from there, I was able to truly live out my dream of being like my mother as loud and as often as I felt like it. And it drove my siblings crazy. And my mother's voice too was so deep. Her voice was so deep that even like over the phone, people thought that she was a man, but it didn't phase her none and it didn't bother at all because she just had this beautiful sultry voice. And when she sang, she could just fill an entire room with joy. I remember as a kid each night, I would, I would ask her to sing to me. I would ask, I would say, mommy, can you please sing to me again? And she'd say, of course, baby. And then she'd start singing to me my favorite song, which is His Eyes on the Sparrow. And just when I was younger, I was, whenever I heard that song, I, and just when I heard those lyrics, when I heard the words of that song, it just felt like everything was going to be all right. And we didn't have a whole lot growing up, but my mother made it feel like it was enough, made it feel like it was more than enough. And where I all, and I know that that song, His Eyes on the Sparrow, is definitely referring to Jesus. And I knew that as a kid. But when I was still younger, and even now, I like to switch up the lyrics to, and I know that she's watching me. Because growing up, when, when I was with my mother, that's where I wanted to be, wherever she could watch me, wherever she could watch me, wherever she was. And for quite some time, wherever where she was watching me was next to her hospital bed in the nursing home. And I had my dad take me to go visit her any chance I get. My, my dad, my sister, or whoever could get me there. I wanted to go every chance I could. And then in the winter of 1999, I was eight when my mother, when my, ah, sorry. In the winter of 1999, I was eight when my mother had passed. But I was nine when I watched my oldest sister become my greatest hero. Our mother had just died and without skipping a single beat, she stepped in and she stepped up to do everything she could to support and help her siblings. All while navigating her own pain and her own grieving and raising a daughter. And over time, I really got to start watching my sister. I got to watch and I got to learn. And I watched Diana as she loved, nurtured, and provided for her seven siblings. I watched, watched Diana sing as often as my mother did, and I watched her channel our mother as she sang through the worst of it and through the best of it. And Diana just became the glue that held our family together. Every single holiday almost was spent at her place, and she'd do whatever she could to make every holiday better than the last one. Every celebration, every birthday, every Christmas, every Easter. Yeah. But then after a few years, I began to live with my father a few times, full time. And in living with him, I began to notice that he was a struggling addict at the time. And, and at that time, our house was slowly beginning to transform into a trap house. And people who don't know what a trap house is, Trap House is a house typically within an inner city where drugs are sold to either addicts or dealers in the area. And my dad was one of the, one of the addicts who frequent the, the person selling drugs in the house because it was a two family unit. 
And I was still really young at the time. I was still maybe 13. And I was scared. I was so scared. And I felt trapped because there wasn't much outside of my world but but that. And so I did I did what I knew how to do. I sang. And then when times got harder, I sang even harder. And at this point, I was also on the on my church choir at uh, at my church, Tridestone Baptist Church. And each of the members on that choir team had a story similar to mine, similar to mine. Each of us just battling with something that we couldn't really talk about because either we couldn't process it or it was just too much. But when we showed up together, none of that mattered. When we showed up together, we showed out together. And it was so wonderful, so beautiful to have, have people to share this gift of the arts, with, to share this gift of music and have that in my life going through such a critical time. And our choir was led by this woman named Kim Famous. And she is one of the most powerful people I've ever met in my entire life. She would direct the band, the choir, the audience, and the church mice all at the same time. Kim had so much fire. She'd always say, project your voice and sing with passion. And soon enough, singing became my purpose. It became my purpose and it became my passion. I remember going to this neighborhood library that was uh, not too far from me, just, just to get on the computer and look up song lyrics. That's all I did when I was there. I had every now and again, I'd run out a book, but my primary focus was to look up song lyrics. And if you're wondering what song lyrics I was looking up at that time, any song that I didn't already know the lyrics to. And for a time, like I felt, I was happy. Things weren't going great, but I was happy because I was able to work with what I had. And I began wanting to work toward mending a damaged relationship with my father. Because as I said before, aside from my choir, I didn't have much, but I still had my dad. And at that time in our relationship, our relationship still had a sense of lightness, despite his addiction. And I was, I was grateful for that. And we'd always have these movie nights and the movies that we'd watch would always either be action or horror, nothing between. It was always one of those extremes and I loved it. It was so much fun. We'd even take turns making dinner for each other. And we'd all, like if dinner wasn't in the house, we'd take turns going out to eat. And the one night where we chose this restaurant, it was a barbecue place. And mom and pop spot this right down the street from where we lived. And we loved it because the people there were like, we're like family to us. They were, there was a really awesome small community barbecue spot that had good service and they were also pretty quick. So when I went and got food, I was in and out pretty quickly before I was heading home. And I got maybe two doors down before a stranger came up to my left side and approached me, asked me and asked me if I had a cigarette. As soon as I got out the words, no, I don't, someone hit me from the right. And when I fell, my head hit the ground two times before being pinned by the barrel of a gun. I remember laying there panicking, not knowing what to do and just being out of it and just feeling stuck. They told me to empty my pockets and what came out was all I had was food because that's all I had. And so give them one final hit before they left, they grabbed the back of food and then they took off. And I finally managed to get home that night. I, I cried, I cried and I was terrified. I weeped really. And I didn't think I would ever leave the house again. And but I still told myself that if I was going to leave the house, that that will never, that will never happen to me again. And so from there, I stopped learning song lyrics and I started learning how to fight. And then by my senior year in high school, well, really how to fight and survive. And then by my senior year in high school, I became a four sport athlete. I was a power lifter because I had to be the strongest. I had to be strong. I ran track and I played football because if I wasn't the strongest, I had to be faster or quicker. I wrestled because if I wasn't faster or stronger, I had to be better. And the people around me, the people around me at that time who knew me, who 
really knew who I was and hung out with me knew that like if you saw me coming, you were either in for a huge warm hug or a series of songs and dance moves with no real discerning ending. <laughs> and you know, I was always grateful for that lightness that I carried despite all of the dark that I went through. I was able to carry that lightness and that goofiness and that wonder and that happiness despite how much was hurting around me. And I was grateful for that. And I'm also grateful to Leroy, who you guys saw in the documentary, because despite growing up in similar circumstances, he mirrored that for me. And, and he was just as goofy, just as funny, just as warm, just as kind and compassionate as I was. And, and we would oftentimes get in trouble on a wrestling team because we'd be laughing like little girls. My, my, my coach's words, not mine. And that was just our friendship. And as you guys saw, eventually it caught the attention of ESPN producer Lisa Finn, who eventually became a part of our part, a part of our family. And as you guys saw, I moved up to the Olympic Training Center in 2010 to train as a U.S. Paralympian. And throughout my judo career, I lived this dream that I didn't even know was attainable. I didn't even know the dream that I could even dream something like this until it was kind of presented in front of me. I didn't even know that opportunities existed like this until I was able to pursue it myself. And I got way more than I bargained for, and it was incredible that my entire career was so incredible. However, as incredible as my career was, it had to come to an end. And I had given everything I had to that career, and I was ready for what was next. And I think for whatever was next for me was ready for me to start stepping into it as well. And, and so many athletes who retire from sport will typically take some time off and just rest and recoup from the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual stress that comes with being a professional Paralympic or Olympic athlete. I didn't do that though. I, Immediately after I retired, I jumped into a social work degree full time. And I was also working full time too. And so there was just no real rest. And I kind of like had it in my mind that I just had to get to this finish line of education and get my degree so I can start my life and finally like get past this next milestone. But I was just feeling so overwhelmed and I was studying social work at the time. But even, even then, as much as I love the field of social work, something didn't click. Something just didn't click like I thought and I hoped that it would. And after a while, after just feeling too overwhelmed to just continue continuing like I was, I decided to quit my job so I could focus on school full time. And doing that, it gave me the space to make changes that I needed to do. And even still, though, after quitting my job, I was still pretty overwhelmed. I actually felt even more overwhelmed. But knowing that changes needed to be made, I ended up changing my major from social work to sociology. And while this was the right decision, because I had fallen in love with the coursework, I had fallen in love with the professors and what it's been, what sociology has been adding to my life and added to my career, especially as I start diving into the world of recovery and resiliency and becoming the coach for that, especially as I also research trauma and mental health and like the elements that come along with those. As much as I jumped into this field, as much as I loved it, because I started my social work, my, so, my social work, I started my sociology uh, degree just last fall semester in 2019 feels like it's been crazy because this year has been, it's been 2020 as I'm sure many of you know and are feeling the same thing. But about halfway through, about halfway through my semester, I was coming up on midterms and I was, I was going into the kitchen to grab some coffee and I was getting ready to study for an exam, a sociology exam, and then just without warning, I collapsed and fell to my knees and just started sobbing started sobbing uncontrollably and when i finally managed to sit with my back against the wall in the kitchen i i put my head up for a second and looked around and just expected to just be in 
and around like fire. I, I just expected the entire world to be on fire, but it wasn't. And it wasn't until later on that I wasn't really, I wasn't reacting at all to my environment. I was reacting to a lot of my unresolved childhood trauma. And after that day, I cried like that for just two weeks straight of just very deep, painful crying. And it was like the floodgates were open and it all just started coming back. And after, after, after those two weeks, like it finally started to slow down and it felt like I was gaining some kind of composure. I was exhausted. I was just completely drained and didn't have much left. And I knew that I had a realization that like from this point, I was going to have to take some responsibility for my own healing and it couldn't wait me longer, but I just didn't really know where to go. And I also at that time felt a sense of wholeness because until since I was a child, I hadn't allowed myself to cry tears of pain like that since I was a kid. I've cried tears of joy and tears of celebration, and even tears of anger, but not, not tears of pain like that. But still, I was tired. And a few weeks passed of me still kind of feeling composed. But one morning, and I'm sure a lot of you are teachers and educators, and yeah, I just woke up one morning feeling tired. I know many of you felt that. You just woke up and just like, oh, also this is how it's gonna be today. <laughs> and every part of me was just like, how, how am I gonna make it through today? How, how am I gonna get through today? And so while lying in bed still, so I just say to myself, just get through this moment. Just get through this moment. And so I get up and I get out of bed. It wasn't much of a start, but it was a start. I say again, just get through this moment, just get through this moment. Every part of me doesn't want to. Every part of me just wants to curl up and cry for the rest of the day and just be done. But just get through this moment. And so I start going through my morning routine and I start brushing my teeth and getting ready for the day, washing my face. And I started feeling more confident and ready for the day. And so as I got up and I started, as I finished my routine, I started telling myself, you know what? I can do this. I can do today. I can get through it. I got this. It's going to be a great day, regardless of how it started. And as I started walking into the kitchen, I was walking past my office and I saw this picture of my mother. Actually, I saw this picture of my mother. And we locked eyes. And I said to myself, Damn, I just washed my face. <laughs> right after I fell to the floor, uncontrollably sobbing, and much worse than the first few weeks. And then just there was my day. My day was that that was so much for my day. And for 45 minutes, I sat there, just knees tucked them under my chest, face in my lap, just crying and sobbing. And then finally, out of desperation, I just, I just say the words, Mommy, could you please sing to me again? And then there was a brief pause. And then afterward, I felt the calm and the stillness sort of wash over me. And my body had finally stopped trembling and my breathing started to slow and start to calm down. And I'm telling you, I think felt the weight of every last word as they came to me. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why? In my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is 
my portion, my constant friend is me, his eye is on the Pharaoh, and I know she watches, she watches me. That concludes our presentation and I'm happy to have further discussion and answer any questions you guys may have. Oh my goodness. D'Artagnan, this is Regina, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> Dr. Lewis, how you doing? It's so good to see you. Uh, you said, if anybody has questions, I think everybody's crying right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was just grateful that I didn't wear my fake eyelashes. <laughs> they might come off. <laughs> Um, you're absolutely incredible. Um, this is a perfect way to end our day. We've gone through an emotional roller coaster this week. Mm. And uh, tomorrow they'll be doing uh, their projects, uh, group projects, and then going into their grow projects and having to have goals. And one thing that your presentation has done, um, at, among many things, is give a little insight to the black man. That it isn't just what we see that the, the, the media wants to show us, that there's so much more. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one black man on this, out of the 78 people, now you make two. And we don't really get to see what uh, society has drawn it to be. And I thank you, I thank you for your humility. I thank you for your vulnerability. I thank you for your trust and your truth. I appreciate your inspiration. Every time I, I even see you, I'm moved. Um, Dartina, now we have one uh, question for you. Uh, the first one that I have is, um, are you planning to go into education with your uh, social work degree? Um, yes actually. Uh, I just heard back from an employer for a, uh, it's called Yes Institute, and I'd be a teacher in this after-school program that works during school hours for at-risk and underserved uh, youth, and I've found, not only have I found education to be my next step, to be my passion and what I want to give to the world, but like I started a job last year just as a part-time job, at this uh, elementary school as a program lead. And I fell in love completely with the job, the students, the work, and found some profound healing in just working in that environment and being able to give to students a lot of what I was lacking as a teacher, as a tutor, mentor, educator, and just and just learn a lot, about, a lot about myself and that, yeah, education is, is the next step for me. I have the next question for you. Are you still in contact with uh, Ms. Fenn? And did you have an educator in your life that made an impact on you as a kid? And what recommendations do you have for making school a safe or a meaningful place for kids like you growing up? Mm. Great questions. Lisa and I are definitely still in contact. A little less now because of COVID and we're both kind of like everyone else putting out small fires as they arrive, <laughs> as they arise. Um, yeah, I had a couple of educators and one of, one of the educators saw that saw me for my potential and not for my circumstance. And again, kind of going back to, to black men in this country, same with black boys. Like as a black boy, I was labeled as either slow or angry or disobedient or just this problem kid or with anger issues. But she saw through that and saw that I was a traumatized kid with unresolved trauma and worked to still see my potential and worked to still hold that space with me, no matter how angry I was or how hurt I was that day. And, and then other teachers who've served as mentors who were coaches and the mentor now who uh, 
have a long-term goal to become an elementary school principal. And my uh, high school health teacher and powerlifting coach and football coach is a current principal now, and we're still in contact. And he's going to serve as a mentor in that process as I continue building this career and building the foundation I'll need for, for that next step. And as far as advice for educators and making a safe space for students who grow up like me is, I think, language and understanding around trauma and creating curriculums that incorporate a trauma-informed approach to students and leading every policy, every decision, every, every opportunity for growth, leading that with children in mind. And yeah, I think having a really, really sound trauma-informed approach, especially for underserved kids, because as I said, what we're seeing is kids aren't showing up just angry or problem kids, they're showing up traumatized in no way at all to work through that or anyone who's meeting them where they're at. The next question that I have is, would it be possible to have you as a guest speaker in schools to speak to students, like elementary, that kind of thing? So if you can share your contact information or- Yes, I can. I'll actually go ahead and throw my email into the chat so you all can have it. And yes, I do do speaking engagements for schools. I also run a, um, a uh, educational program called Compassion Distance Learning that and what it is essentially is, uh, let me find this chat real quick. Um, what, it is, what it is essentially is for 30 to 45 minute Q&A or well talk discussions between athletes and uh, Olympic and Paralympic athletes, retired or otherwise, and students. Um, okay. Yeah, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also on uh, LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, but yeah, I do definitely uh, do speaking engagements and we're happy to have additional conversation outside of this. You were saying something about the compassion distance learning. And yeah, then... compassionate distance learning, yes. So it's- Compassionate. It's, yeah, it's a discussion. It's an educational program that I've uh, created and I can send the details to, uh, like people, if you guys reach out to me, I have a uh, a letter that I put together, essentially explaining what it is and how people can participate. But it's I, from my research and experience, I pulled out a, a list of topics that I found it to be incredibly relevant in human growth, development, connection, and also just understanding in life, like very real world skills that aren't taught in education. That, isn't taught in academia, but then this language still gets lost to the masses, especially the underserved, under under uh, served populations. And the topics are resiliency, hope, um, social networking, emotional health, mental health, relationship health, and, uh, and there's a few other topics that uh, where the teacher will choose a topic. And the teacher will be on a call too, or if it's a tutor, if it's an after school program. And then they would do a conversation with the uh, athlete. The athlete will share their story and how that term. So, for example, share their story as an athlete and their personal story and how they've used social networking to either create better paths in their, skill, in their uh, career or propel them forward in life or just what the dimensions of that looks like and how you can just start that now. And so far I've found it to just be amazing and I've loved every session that I've done. And yeah, that's also uh, something that, that, I, that I'm working toward and that I'm offering for students. It's completely free. There's no buy-in, there's no sign up. You just contact me. I'll reach out to my athletes who I have on board for like four speaking engagements and that. And then from there, we'll coordinate whatever uh, platform you guys use. I'm able to f make that as flexible as I can. And then we'll just go with every time you guys work. And then I'll work to get an athlete that can fit that time for that video, that, for that video chat. So uh, the next question that I have, I work with individuals in the criminal justice system 
many of whom have struggled with trauma and substance abuse. I see the role of coaches, peers, especially important. Can you uh, talk more about your role as a uh, resilience, uh, resiliency and recovery coach? Yeah, so this is a job that I actually am just stepping into. Um, and it's with an online company called Ngomu. And so they do a lot of corporate trainings where they'll have like a, a large net of subscribers that can like go to, it's like going on, to, it's like being subscribed to a TED talk, but they're trainings in like relevant topics to personal growth and development. And, and what I have in mind to, and how I would run my recovery and resilience courses would be to bring in a lot of generalized information in those areas and sort of provide understanding into resiliency as opposed to just survival and also recovery as opposed to just complacency and how language falls in that as well in the language that we use in our day to day when we're trying to be resilient or we're trying to recover from something as well as understanding more intricate topics such as trauma. I bring a lot of trauma informed information into what I do in recovery and resiliency because I think it's I think people who are really trying to find understanding in that potentially carry trauma. And even if you don't, having that understanding the basis of of trauma, like the generalized knowledge of trauma is linked to having a story that that has damaged us over time. So trauma, it's, it's essentially a wound that continues happening to you. And understanding of how we have that story and how we need to reshape and rewrite that narrative and find meaningful healing to actually move past that. Otherwise, unresolved trauma can result in addiction, can result in other physical manifestations such as ADHD, uh, focus issues, other attention issues, and and anxiety and depression, especially if it goes on. And this is the stuff I've even just had personal experiences with. And uh, sorry, I'm starting to lose my train of thought. I had it. I had it, but I hope that answers here. <laughs> the next question that I have here on my list, um, are you able to be a mentor uh, for your seven siblings to follow in your steps? footsteps yeah um not necessarily a mentor but additional support because i'm the youngest of my siblings and my siblings are are doing well themselves in their own way and yeah not necessarily a mentor but a coach in some ways because there's a lot of knowledge and understanding that I have from my career as a judo athlete, from my career as an athlete envoy and speaker and, and a lot of things that help with either starting a business, personal growth or development and things like that. A lot of, have a lot of resources as well that I can help with connection and guidance. But yeah, not like a mentor, yeah, not like a direct mentoring sort of relationship. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I'd like to thank you very much, D'Artagnan. I, I will be respectful of your time. It's 4 p.m. So thank you very much. Back to the Reginas. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate your time.